So let me just pray uh, before we look at Acts 5 from verse 17. So, Father, we come before you and thank you for your inspired word. And we pray tonight, Lord, that your word would come to us, not in word alone, but in the power of the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. We confess our need of the power of the Holy Spirit mm. as we look at your word now. So come in order that word and spirit may combine together uh, and that your word would have such a powerful impact on our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, I'm reading for Acts 5, and uh, you might want to put yourself on mute. Just oh, so you can I've lost you. Uh, halfway through the recording. <laughs> Uh, so pop yourself on mute. That would be great. Uh, so oh. Acts 5 from verse 17. The high priest and his officials who were Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. Then he told them, go to the temple and give the people the, this message of life. So at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple as they were told and immediately began teaching. When the high priest and his officials arrived, they convened the high council, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. Then they sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail uh, for trial. But when the temple guards went to the jail, the men were gone. So they returned to the council and reported the jail was securely locked with the guards standing outside. But when we opened the gates, no one was there. When the captain of the temple guard and the leading priests heard this, they were perplexed, wondering where it would all end. Then someone arrived with startling news. The men you put in jail are standing in the temple, teaching the people. The captain went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles, but without violence, for they were afraid the people would stone them. Then they brought the apostles before the high council, where the high priest confronted them. We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name, he said. Instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honour at his right hand as prince and saviour. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit who is given by God to those who obey him. When they heard this, the high council was furious and decided to kill them. But one member, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, who was an expert in religious law and respected by all the people, stood up and ordered that the men be sent outside the council chamber for a while. Then he said to his colleagues, men of Israel, take care what you're planning to do to these men. Some time ago, there was that fellow, Thudis, who pretended to be someone great. About 400 others joined him, but he was killed and all his followers went their various ways. The whole movement came to nothing. After him, 
at the time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee. He got people to follow him, but he was killed too, and all his followers were scattered. So my advice is leave these men alone. Let them go. If they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. The others accepted his advice. They called in the apostles and had them flogged. Then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. So part of preparing for revival is recognizing that it's not just as simple to say that revival is the answer to all of our problems. All we need is God to move in in power and life will be just wonderful. The presence of God will sweep in. All the enemies of God will uh, either, they'll either come to the Lord or they'll be obliterated. No, it doesn't quite happen like that, does it? Um, revival is not necessarily the answer to all of our problems. And in Acts 5, 12 to 16, we have a summary of an incredible period uh, in the early uh, church uh, that involved signs and wonders and miracles and healings, uh, people being delivered from evil spirits, hundreds, possibly thousands of people coming to know Jesus. So that's the context for the passage that we've just read. God's on the move in powerful ways and the passage the previous passage says that more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord so tumultuous times of great joy in the early church and rapid change things were happening really fast uh, as hundreds and thousands of people came to faith so <laughs> You know, the church of then, you know, the church yesterday maybe had three, four, five thousand. Then the next day, they were up to seven, eight, nine thousand. And it kept moving <laughs> like that. You know, there was no time for that early church to be stuck in, you know, inflexible ways of thinking. You know, they're not about to have a debate about the colour of the carpet or where the worship band is allowed to stand. And all of these small things that some churches get, you know, stuck in uh, petty little things, they were completely irrelevant. They were swept away by the power of God. Uh, and they were asking questions like, how on earth are we going to disciple thousands of new converts. Now, how are we going to keep preaching the gospel in and around Jerusalem? Uh, and how are we going to handle things with the religious leaders? Uh, and the enemies of God are usually defined as being the world, the flesh, and the devil. And what that meant for the early church was uh, the world, uh, the worldly system of political power and governance uh, that was there in those days. But, you know, think about that in our context, the world, worldly system of political power and governance that has no reference to the Lordship of Christ. The flesh 
involves the sinful fallen nature of men and women who live their lives apart from the lordship of Christ. So the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil is the wicked spiritual power, a personal spiritual power seeking to subvert, disrupt, and prevent uh, the works of God and the kingdom of God advancing. The last thing the devil wants is for the church to move forward and grow. And he wants to destroy the church and get people to believe in his lies. So the enemies of God can be found expressed through all of those areas, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the, the mistake that we can sometimes make is to associate the enemies of God only with a particular people group or political group. Uh, and that would be, you know, a, a, really an oversimplification uh, to say that the devil's a bit more cunning than that. What we need to do is discern and understand the spirit and source of power that is being operated in and take our stand in the full armor of God. So I'll say that again, we need the gift of discernment to know and understand the spirit and source of power that is being operated in so that we can take our stand against that in the full armor of God. And in Acts 5, 17 and 18, we read about religious political powers that were filled with jealousy. The church was experiencing rapid exponential growth and not everyone liked it. So there was this rapid, sudden clash of two kingdoms and the jealousy was ugly. It was threatening and angry and intimidating, seeking to intimidate the church. And we shouldn't expect that any revival in our day will be any different. There will be opposition and sometimes that opposition may even turn ugly and that is very much in the history books of revival. So currently in China and Russia many church leaders have been arrested and thrown in prison. I think in both China and Russia there is a state recognized church which is very much infiltrated by the secret services of both China and Russia. Uh, the underground church which is much larger is really now considered in these nations to be illegal. And if anyone is found to be part of the underground church they are arrested and imprisoned. And in other countries, the church is under even greater persecution in these days. Afghanistan, North okay. Korea, Somalia, Libya, Yemen, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, yep. India. These nations are Christians are facing severe persecution. And according to Open Doors, 6,000 Christians were murdered for their faith last year alone. So that's last year alone, 6,000 believers. So persecution of the church and especially church leaders is on the rise. 
In Acts 5, the source of the opposition was jealous political religious powers. They saw their own power base being eroded and thousands of regular attendees were leaving the synagogues and converting to Christianity. And they just were not willing to stand aside and watch that happen. What about Scotland and the UK? Mm -hmm. This is where the application starts getting a bit more interesting. Where are the enemies of the church in our context? Well, here are several areas to think about. Firstly, the religious political powers in our day. How are the current religious political powers in the UK and in Scotland, how are they in opposition to God? Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about um, the Church of Scotland General Assembly over the last five years or so, and the introduction of gay marriage, that was voted through by a majority of church ministers. But it's not just about the Church of Scotland. The Scottish Episcopal Church went even further and voted in a majority to redefine marriage altogether, to include gay marriage. And it's not just about Scotland. There's a, a large group in the Anglican Church moving in that direction. And the Methodist Church in the last six months or so has also accepted gay marriage. So religious political powers acting contrary to the word of God and standing in opposition to the word of God. How can God bless such a church? So we need to pray into that, the religious political powers in our nation. And many of these people who are ex exercising religious political power they don't even know Jesus it's just a job secondly secular political powers and uh, David Holdaway spoke about this a couple of weeks ago uh, in fact was that last week yes it was <laughs> that was last week uh, he spoke about the secularization of Britain. And if we look at some of the behaviors in, uh, within our government, both the Scottish government and Westminster, in terms of immorality, uh, lying, cheating, uh, policies formed on a liberal agenda, liberal and moral agenda, all going in the wrong way, away from the word of God and the ways of God. So we, we need to be praying for those uh, in political power that they will exercise integrity and honesty and be the kind of leaders that can be actually looked up to rather than, you know, in recent days, if you look at the, the press and the media, uh, it has been really utterly ridiculing uh, the prime minister and many others in government. An absolute mockery. Uh, 
that's the sad reality of secular political powers that have really turned away from God and his ways. Thirdly, is the enemy within. And that can be within ourselves or within the church. Yeah. And that, that's really got to do with walking in the flesh. When, when Christians backslide and walk in the flesh and compromise, the result is that the bar is lowered things in the church become acceptable that that are not acceptable in the word of god mm -hmm. and we compromise and we sweep things under the carpet and uh, how can god bless that approach to church life he can't so we pray that the Holy Spirit will do a deep work in our own hearts where there's compromise, but also in the wider church. A couple of key areas uh, to consider as well that have been mentioned before is the LGBT movement mm -hmm. and how that has influenced many churches many church leaders who are now embracing uh, gay marriage and the power of that movement to influence the nation to accept a particular morality that is contrary to the Bible. Uh, it's an incredibly powerful political movement and uh, we really need to pray that somehow God will break the power of that movement over the nation and that the word of God will be lifted up again and honoured and obeyed as the word of God. And lastly is uh, the pro-abortion movement mm -hmm. where millions of the unborn have been sacrificed. Such a tragic loss of millions of lives through abortion. And the attitude in the UK against uh, pro-life is so entrenched. It's, you know, the, there's more openness to pro-life beliefs in America and the, there's maybe even the possibility of uh, Roe versus Wade being turned around in America but in the UK there is such a widespread acceptance of abortion mm -hmm. uh, pretty much abortion on demand so somehow we need to pray into that that the power of that would be broken. So what can we learn from the early church in Acts 5? Well, firstly, we need to ask God for dynamite. The Greek word for power is dunamis. Uh, so Acts 1 verse 8, you will receive dunamis, power. Mm -hmm. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. The only reason that the apostles were able to stand up with boldness and speak out was because they had dunamis power. Uh, they could not do it by themselves. So Jesus had promised them that they would know the power of the Holy Spirit and they received that power. And we need to receive that power 
in our day, in these days, so that we will be bold and gracious to speak out the word of God. And we need to be prepared to speak out, yeah, not, not in an unkind or, or nasty way at all, but be prepared to speak out, to be a witness for the Lord, to, to say, actually, no, I don't believe that. I believe that God has a better way. Thirdly, be prepared for the God of miracles. Mm -hmm. Because we read of that in Acts chapter 5, when the apostles were able just to walk out of the prison and they saw signs and wonders and healings and miracles. It's the same God today as in Acts chapter 5 that we believe in. So be prepared, be open, be willing to lay hands on the sick and pray for healing. Mm -hmm. Ask for the prophetic word that will break open a situation. Ask for words of knowledge that will break open people's hearts to be open to know Jesus for themselves. And fourthly, be prepared for persecution. But don't go looking for it. So we're not trying to goad people into persecuting Christians. <laughs> but there's the very real possibility of persecution in these days. In Acts 5, the apostles were facing death again. But thanks to one Pharisee called Gamaliel, they were released. And this is what we read in Acts 5.41. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. So God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. Now, what on earth does that really mean? They were counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. But I think it provides us with an echo of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And here is what Jesus says in Matthew 6. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of oh, heaven. Jesus. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Interesting question. Have you ever been persecuted in some way for your faith? Maybe in your workplace or by friends? or even family members. I'd be interested to know um, what you know, everyone's answer is to that question. I certainly have in some way uh, been persecuted when uh, you know, I worked on a large project in financial services, over a hundred people in the project. And uh, when the overall boss found out I was a believer and uh, she didn't like it at all. And she ensured that I was treated very badly. 
And I could tell you a lot more about that story, but that's maybe for another time. But the possibility of persecution is very much there in our society now, uh, especially as the nation continues in the direction it's been going. Uh, it's more likely that persecution will only increase. Now, we don't look for it, uh, and we don't behave in such a way that deliberately provokes persecution, but I do believe it will come nevertheless. And Jesus says that for those who face persecution because of him, their reward will be great in heaven. Persecution makes no earthly sense at all. It's horrible. It's terrible. It's evil. But in the light of heavenly reward, that's where the sense comes. That's why um, the apostles, let me read that verse again. Verse 41, the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. So what I thought it would be good to do during our prayer time is to ask the Lord for this dunamis power in our own lives, but also in the wider church. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Acts 1.8, and you will be my witnesses. Of course, the, the, the Greek word for witness is uh, martyr. In other words, a laying down of our lives so that the power of God would flow through us. Uh, so we pray for boldness for the church in these days to speak out. We ask the God of miracles, the same God in Acts 5 who worked healings and miracles and deliverance, would work the same miracles in our day. And we pray that if we face persecution, God will help us to honour his name in our lives. And the last thing I'd like to do before we pray is to show you a very short video. And this is from uh, Open Doors. And it was released last week, last week in the Houses of Parliament. Uh, a large group of several hundred met, including 93 MPs, to hear the updated watch list uh, be released by Open Doors. And Open Doors is an organisation that deals with the persecuted church. There are countries where Christians live in fear where churches are bombed and houses burned, where following Jesus means sacrificing jobs, security, family. There are countries where you must keep your faith secret or it might get you killed. These are the countries of the Open Doors World Watch List. And here are the 10 countries where following Jesus costs the most. Number 10, India. Many extremists claim that to be Indian is to be Hindu. They want an India without religious minorities, and they are using violence to achieve it. Number 9. Iran Iranian Christians must meet secretly. Being discovered could mean long sentences in appalling prisons. Number 8. Pakistan Christians in Pakistan are considered second-class citizens. Innocent believers are falsely accused of blasphemy. Thousands of women are victims of kidnap and forced conversion. Number 7. Nigeria 
Nigeria is the country where Christians face the most outright violence. Many Christians have been killed or driven from their homes. Number 6. Eritrea More than 1,000 Christians are imprisoned for their faith in Eritrea. Some pastors have been locked up for over a decade without charge. Number 5. Yemen Yemeni culture is tribal. Those who leave the tribal faith could be banished or even killed. Number 4. Libya In this lawless land, Libyan Christians have to keep their faith secret or risk punishment, arrest or death. Number 3. Somalia Islamist extremists consider Somali Christians high-value targets, so the tiny population of only a few hundred secret believers keep out of sight. Number 2. North Korea There are around 400,000 Christians in North Korea. All of them must hide their faith. Discovery means exile, execution, or being worked to death in horrific labor camps. Number 1. Afghanistan The Taliban takeover means that Afghanistan is the new number one, the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. Many Christians have become refugees. Those who remain must keep their faith utterly secret. There are countries where Christians live in fear, but fear can lead to courage and courage leads to hope. At least 360 million Christians around the world experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. But they have not given up. And for over 65 years, Open Doors has stood with them. Where Christians are persecuted, our global underground networks supply smuggled Bibles and Christian books, spiritual care, emergency food and aid, training and legal advice. Where Christians are free, we work with local churches to raise our voices in prayer, to speak truth to those in power, to strengthen our persecuted family around the world. Because there are countries where Christians have to stay silent, and there are countries where Christians can make a noise. But we are all connected. We are all family, and together we can help one another to follow Jesus, no matter the cost.